Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jacqueline Dorsey of Lean Frontiers and I'll serve as your host today. I'm excited to bring to you today a short webinar on Lean product development facilitated by Durwood Sobeck. He is a professor and program coordinator of industrial management systems engineering at Montana State University and has co-authored a Shingo Prize winning book. I have a couple of notes before we begin. Due to our limited time, we will not be doing a Q&A session. Also, this will be recorded if you want to refer back to it later. So for now, let me turn things over to Derwood. Great. Thank you, Jacqueline. And uh, welcome to this webinar on set-based innovation. As Jackie mentioned, I am a professor at Montana State University and program coordinator of industrial management systems engineering. I've been doing research in lean product development for almost two decades now, and it's been a really exciting journey. And I'm really excited to share with you a little bit about uh, this topic. Uh, some of you may know that we came out with the second edition of Alan Ward's Lean Product and Process Development book, and uh, you can always find more details about uh, set based innovation and other lean product and process development topics uh, in that book. I thought I might start uh, with a situation that you might find familiar. Um, perhaps there's been a uh, issue that's popped up in production and that produces uh, a lot of excitement in the organization and a lot of firefighting and management of course wants to stay on top of what's going on. And so what they would like to do is uh, get reports on how things are going. Of course, when that happens, uh, that means that the team or the team lead has to take time out of their uh, day to prepare the report and then actually conduct the report. And of course, that means less time for development work, which can then produce more issues that are overlooked and more fire firefighting. And if uh, if that continues, oftentimes management wants a greater frequency of reports, which means less time for development work, and, um, and if that continues, then we can end up in quite a vicious cycle. If that doesn't sound familiar to you, then maybe something like this, uh, where a, a, uh, we have a failure in prototype testing, and a project that was on time yesterday is now three months behind today. And of course, our management wants to be helpful, and so uh, when they see the schedule slip, uh, perhaps they want to add some resources to the team to help get things back on schedule. Well, of course, whenever you add more resources, that requires additional coordination on the team. That means less time for development work, and even though the team is bigger, you might actually find that the schedule still continues to slip. And if we continue along that path, of course, we can end up in another vicious cycle. Of course, where do those resources come from? Well, they come from the next project, which means that project starts behind. So the question I have to these scenarios is, do these responses really address the root causes of what's going on? And as you ponder that question, uh, let me add a comment to say, well, uh, if they are, then why are these recurring themes in many companies? So I would suggest that if it's a recurring theme, then we probably haven't got to the root cause of the problem. One of the things that oftentimes precipitates or is, a, is a behind the scenes in these loops, in these uh, vicious cycles, are what we call uh, loopbacks. And a loopback is any time that we are redo redoing development work that's been completed earlier in the project. And that usually means we're revisiting a decision that was made um, in light of additional information that has, uh, has has come to the attention of the team. So in the prototype test failure situation there, we went in with a certain decision and then we were surprised by the results and so we're going to have to redo some development work, some design work, some engineering analysis work uh, to uh, bring that design in compliance with our design requirements. So that's a loopback, and um, 
one thing that we have seen is that there does seem to be quite a bit of developer time spent on loopbacks. In fact, some of the companies we talk to, the number can get quite large. Um, some might estimate 30, 40 percent of time. We've had others that have estimated that it might be as much as three quarters of development time of a developer's time is spent uh, redoing work that they had already done previously. In other words, they're spending a lot of their time in these loopbacks. So why do they occur? And there might be lots of reasons why um, they occur, but a lot of those reasons come back to sort of a basic um, idea that you learn something later that you didn't know earlier. And had you known that information, you probably would have done things differently. So fundamentally, loopbacks occur because of a lack of knowledge. If we can get that knowledge earlier in the process, then hopefully we can make better decisions that we don't have to revisit later in the project. So let's talk a little bit about the, I guess, theory behind why we might think this way. Most would agree that the cost of looking at a new alternative increases as you go through the project. So early in the project when you're dealing with um, sketches on the back of a napkin or on a whiteboard, uh, to explore a new idea is really marginally, the marginal cost for a new idea is very, very small. Then as we get into uh, developing uh, CAD models and 3D solid models, we start adding detail to those ideas. And to make a change is a little bit more expensive than just the sketches. And then certainly as we get into prototyping, uh, to look at a, uh, particularly some of the more um, high fidelity types of prototypes that we would do life cycle testing on, for example, those can get quite expensive. And then the most expensive at all of all would be uh, trying to look at a new idea when we're already in production, such as trying to deal with a production issue, a yield issue, or warranty uh, problem. And most would agree that not only does the cost to look at a new alternative increase with over the length life of the project, it actually increases in a geometric fashion like the curve that you see on this on the screen there. And you can put your own function uh, there, but uh, for your own company or industry, but a lot of folks would say, you know what, each phase there's sort of a tenfold increase in the cost of looking at a new idea or the cost of making a change. So researchers in product development have studied uh, engineering changes in product development and what they find is that there seems to be um, a lot more changes later in the development cycle than earlier. And um, this is sort of a little bit counterintuitive in if you put it on the uh, cost of, if you map it on the cost of learning curve, because it looks like we're um, investigating new ideas when it's pretty expensive to do that. Wouldn't it be better to front load the project so that you look at lots of ideas early on and where it's relatively inexpensive to do that investigation of new ideas so that when you get into those later phases, you're not having to make so many changes? A different perspective, rather than looking at the cost of development, is what some have called the designer's dilemma. And this is uh, a phenomenon that we're all familiar with. If you've ever got to the end of a project and said, wow, if I knew then what I know now, boy, I would have done things differently. And if you've said that, you, you've experienced the designer's dilemma. And the designer's dilemma is simply this, that early on in the project, you have all the freedom in the world to do whatever you want as far as proposing solutions and so forth. But unfortunately, you have the least amount of knowledge uh, that you will during the life of this project. And then as you make decisions and, uh, and you move forward with the development or the design process, uh, your design freedom actually decreases over time because every decision you make constrains what you can do next. Uh, but you're also learning, so your knowledge is increasing over time. Uh, but unfortunately, by the time you hit the near the end of the project, you have the most knowledge, but the least amount of freedom to be able to actually use that knowledge. So that's the designer's dilemma. So if we look at 
that engineering change order pattern that we looked saw before, again, uh, it seems like it wouldn't be the wisest thing to be trying to make changes late in our process because that's when at a point in the design process where we've made the most decisions and therefore uh, we've added a lot of constraint and we have the least amount of design freedom. Wouldn't it make more sense to do that exploration at a point where it, we have the most design freedom and kind of follow that same curve down? If we do that, then we also have the opportunity to actually change the curvature of that knowledge growth curve so that we learn rapidly early in the process and can then make hopefully wiser and better choices. So just to recap, um, loopbacks are a pretty big source of waste in product development organizations. And oftentimes the common management response is do not address the root causes of the loopbacks. And as we saw in a couple of those um, negatively reinforcing cycles, they can actually make the situation worse because they're not addressing the root causes and they actually produce other problems uh, besides the loopbacks. Fundamentally, a lot of loopbacks occur due to a lack of knowledge. Not all of them. We can probably come up with some examples where it's not, but, uh, but oftentimes if we ask why enough, we get back to, you know what, we just didn't know that, and that's what got us um, in the end. And I hopefully you agree that it makes economic and logical sense to invest in knowledge early in a project so that you can front load that project up and make better decisions early and therefore not have to uh, try to make changes late in the process. In other words, uh, try to avoid those loopbacks. So the question then, as by way of introduction, is how can we front load product development projects? Now if you poke around in the literature, you can find a number of different answers uh, about uh, um, you know team staffing and team resourcing and, and different things like that. Um, and those are all good things. But what I would like to focus in on is how you can use step-based innovation to help you front load a development project. So that's what we're going to talk about um, today. So I thought it would be interesting for us to go at this by talking about a very famous example of a development project, uh, the Wright brothers and designing the first airplane. Of course, this is a real challenge if you're back at the turn of the 19th century, or near the end of the 19th century, I should say, <clears throat> because uh, if you're testing a prototype, um, it's a pretty dangerous endeavor. In fact, uh, if the prototype fails, then your life is endangered. There are a lot of people at that time trying to be the first to invent uh, heavier-than-air powered flight. Uh, so here's some examples on the screen. There's Otto Lilienthal from Germany who tried for 10 years with 2,000 test flights over, those ten, over that 10-year period. Unfortunately, he died in one of his flights in 1896 and never did succeed. There's uh, a fellow in France, a Frenchman, a Clement Adder, spent quite a bit of money over a 25-year period and never did achieve that uh, holy grail of powered flight. Um, in England, here Maxim, the inventor of the machine gun, invested, um, also invested a large sum of money and still didn't succeed. And here in the U.S., Samuel Langley um, was given, awarded by the U.S. government $70,000 to work on developing um, of the first aircraft and he spent over 16 years and he never did achieve a manned flight that lasted for longer than a few seconds. And that few seconds was the amount of time to launch a glider um, over the Hudson River. He had a contraption set up where you would launch gliders off, of, off a launch boat uh, over the Hudson River and uh, they could stay up in the air for a few seconds till they crashed into the, into the uh, river. Well, how about the Wright brothers? Well, the Wright brothers are really interesting because they actually don't have university degrees, never did. 
Um, they spent a fraction of the money. Uh, they didn't have a lot of resources. In fact, this was uh, a hobby of theirs. They ran a bicycle shop for their main income. So they only had a couple of people and they had to spread their development out over fits and you know different uh, spurts, fits and spurts of development work. And here's the interesting thing. Their first full prototype flew. In other words, they didn't have any loopbacks. So you might be asking yourself, wow, that's quite a difference. How did they do that? Well, you can read a lot about what the Wright brothers did and didn't do, uh, but uh, here's, uh, from my perspective, they actually innovated an entirely different approach. So one of the things that they did is they first identified that they had some knowledge gaps, and three are documented in their journals. In-flight control, uh, wing design, and propulsion. The first one that they ended up uh, tackling, I'm not, not sure that it was intentional that it was this one first, but it was the one that they tackled first, was how do we get in-flight control? And uh, they were able to do some systematic testing on what you might consider to be subsystem prototypes, right? Gliders or kites. Uh, and they came up with a couple of different ways that they could do that control. You have the diagram there showing that. One of the things that they discovered as they were towing one of their kites behind is that they needed to control for yaw. They had uh, roll and uh, what's the other one? Uh, tilt? No. Sorry, you got two of the axes, but they couldn't, uh, they didn't account for yaw, and so that was one thing that they had to do. The other thing that they did is they discovered that the existing lift tables that were used for wing design and that Samuel Langley was using were actually incorrect. Every wing that they designed using those tables didn't work. And rather than blaming themselves, they blamed the lift tables and said, you know what, we need to corroborate uh, these findings. So uh, they moved from flying kites to the wind tunnel, which uh, they're pretty famous for, and they developed a lift balance there to uh, evaluate different wind foils. And they actually ended up testing a bunch of different airfoils for uh, lift and drag. And they recorded those data in their journals in the form of the curves that you see on your screen. After they had tested uh, dozens of those airfoils, and they had a good idea of what lift and drag should be like. They built a subsystem glider. Uh, it's not powered. There's no power on this. They're just testing the wing design now. And they can also see evidence of their latest iteration of the uh, in-flight control. And they floated this glider. And you can see one of the Wright brothers there chasing his glider <laughs> down the sand dunes of Kitty Hawk. To close the propulsion gap, uh, they had a breakthrough realization, and that is that a propeller is really just a wing turned on its side and rotating rather than stationary. And if that was the case, then they could use the, uh, the existing airfoil curves to design uh, a pretty efficient propeller. So they did that, and you can see the uh, replica of the original uh, propeller that they used which is still, by the way, very efficient even by today's standards. And you can see that the cross-section of the propeller diff uh, changes as you move from the rotating hub out to the tip of the wing. And that's because you have different air velocities at different points along the way, and therefore the most efficient airfoil is going to be different. The nice thing about that is that <clears throat> this highly efficient propeller allowed for a much smaller motor, uh, which, of course, weighs much less and would be much easier than to design a wing to support that lighter load. So they had closed the propulsion gap with that wind tunnel data. So now with all the knowledge caps clo closed, they designed and built a full system prototype that they transported down to Kitty Hawk. And... Uh, and they actually flew this uh, aircraft that you see there. Uh, the first test flight uh, actually crashed, but that was due to pilot error. And once they had fixed uh, their plane, they repaired it. And while they were repairing it, actually, uh, one of the brothers sent a telegram to their father and explained, you know, just giving an update on progress that 
they crashed the aircraft, but success was assured because they knew that the that the aircraft was going to work. It was just due to pilot error that it didn't fly. And uh, so they made the repairs, and then it flew uh, the maiden voyage, and that's the one that's in the history books. So the thing that's really amazing to me is that their first prototype flew, and they didn't have to actually redesign that prototype, at least in terms of uh, the functionality that they were looking to achieve. So that brings us, by way of introduction, to actually the first principle of set-based innovation. And that's this idea of developing knowledge, or trade-off curves, that inform you about the design space. So that when you actually get down to designing the thing, you know where you're at. You know that you're in that feasible region. And you can be assured of success as you move into the later stages of your development process. If we look at the Wright brothers, we can see that they turn the development logic on its head. Rather than doing the old design, build, test, or design, simulate, test, or design, analyze, uh, design, build, test, and then redesign, right? So design, analyze, redesign. They actually went the other way. They said, you know what? We have a basic idea of how we want to do this, but let's test at the subsystem level, lots of ideas. Let's characterize uh, our desi design space with respect to how these different parameters affect the functional performance of our design. And once we understand those relationships, then we uh, can come up with a good design. And when we do that, then the knowledge that we create there is useful not only for this project, but for all future projects. In fact, those basic airfoil curves um, have been built upon by the predecessor of NASA, the NACA. Um, airfoil curves are still used today to help design that because of, to help design aircraft wings because they're based in the fundamental physics. Ron Marsilio at Teledyne Benthos shares a story about how his development group was working on a new bottle inspection machine, and they worked very hard to develop trade-off curves before they uh, sat down and did the detailed design work. And here's an example of one of them that they used. Um, they had developed, I think, a couple of dozen around uh, different parameters of their, uh, of their concept. And uh, when they sat down to do the detailed design, it went very quickly. They didn't have to, they didn't have any trouble in production. They didn't have any trouble uh, at the beta test sites and they produced a machine that became a real money winner for their company because uh, they had that opportunity to really understand where they needed to be in the design space and then they could do the detailed design very rapidly. You don't have to necessarily generate new data. Sometimes you can use historical data as in this example here where uh, this company had pulled uh, data from from historical design, die tryout data, and they were able to map out a couple of different parameters. And when they discovered that um, the designs that have good manufacturability were in one portion of the design space, and others and the others that had poor manufacturability were in the other part of the design space, uh, they could come up with a pretty uh, easy way for them to test the, the manufacturability. This is the design limits of our manufacturing system as it stands right now. And as long as you stay on the one side of the curve, we can guarantee, at least on this particular uh, dimension, uh, that you're going to probably have a manufacturable product. The second principle of set-based innovation is what um, I've called here parallel convergence. To explain this concept, I'm going to look, go back to sort of the conventional way of thinking about the design process. And that's one of uh, basically an iterative mindset as opposed to a convergent mindset. And in this case, what happens is that, uh, you know, of course, we all want to generate lots of ideas. 
for solving a given problem, but typically what will happen is we'll evaluate that in a preliminary way and choose what we think is the best and you know, most promising alternative. We'll work on that alternative, uh, add some detail to it, analyze it, look for uh, ways that we can improve it, and, until, and we just go through that iteration process until we have uh, met our design requirements. One way to uh, characterize that is that um, you're moving from point to point in the design space. So each um, iteration is a different point in the design space. So we call that a point to point search for the solution. And if you use that in your companies, then it can cause all kinds of problems because it's really difficult to know when you actually converge. And it's really difficult to know. Uh, where to go next. And oftentimes you don't really produce knowledge that's useful for another project because unless you want to go backwards through your design process, it doesn't really provide you with very much knowledge that you can go forward. And a big uh, issue is that it's really difficult for teams to work concurrently because uh, the, the process is pretty unpredictable and a change in one part of the system can precipitate changes elsewhere. In contrast to that, we might look at a situation that looks like this, where rather than communicating my best idea, we communicate a set of alternatives, and we compare that with um, a space of alternatives on the other side. Now, this, this case, we're looking at product design versus manufacturing, but they could be any two interfacing subsystems. So if we can identify that intersection and then go through our process of a of development elimination by staying within that uh, identified um, intersection, then we have a process that becomes quite reliable and it allows both sides to then <clears throat> uh, work concurrently, um, adding increasing detail as they work their way through the development process. So an example of that would be in automotive development, uh, a lot of times the styling group will have a process that's very convergent. And uh, rather than trying to pick an early winner from their initial set of alternatives, they will either choose a set or what I like to suggest is eliminate those that don't work and carry forward those that are still promising. When they do that, then they increase the level of fidelity. They don't run all the way to full, fully uh, realized CAD model. They just take it to the next stage of development where they can do further evaluation and further elimination um, and so forth until they converge to a final design. Now in parallel with that, the engineering group is also looking at those alternatives and they're doing in the early stages some design studies. They don't do complete um, engineering analysis, but they focus in on areas that look like they might be problematic and they look at alternatives from an engineering standpoint, um, how they could support that styling alternative, and they run their design studies. And that information then is used in that elimination process so that um, you're not making the convergence process is not done from just one perspective, but it's done from more of a systems perspective. So in other words, it looks kind of like this, where we have uh, both uh, groups converging in parallel, sharing information back and forth so that it informs the development of the other, and we can look for what would be compatible designs. So that when we finally converge, uh, we don't have to loop back. Uh, the Ford Motor Company, in their recent uh, transformation, in instituted what they call the Kento phase. Kento is borrowed from uh, Japanese, it just means study, where they study multiple alternatives um, in this early phase in order to identify the pluses and minuses and compatibility with other subsystems in order to make their elimination decisions. And this produced a great deal of efficiency and effectiveness in their development process. Here's just another picture of looking at that where if you're looking at different, uh, just kind of a Venn diagram, of alternatives and you're really looking for where's that overlap in um, the different possibilities and alternatives in terms of where you're going to find your acceptable designs. <clears throat>
One thing that's really helpful uh, in this uh, convergence process is if you can have some flexibility in your initial specifications. Again, similar to that knowledge curve, uh, it's very difficult, I think, to set your specifications early in the project because you know the least about you have the least amount of knowledge at that point. So if you can have a little bit of uh, flexibility through target specifications, and then after you understand the trade-off space, you can narrow in on exactly what the specification that you want, that can really help speed up your design process and allow you to balance the trade-offs to maximize the overall system performance. So that might look a little bit like this with any given specification that you might start with a desired and a minimum acceptable requirement and then as you learn more you gradually narrow in on what that final specification would be. All right, so then uh, our final uh, principle that we're going to talk about today is step-based innovation is feasibility um, before commitment. So you may be asking yourself, well, how do I manage that convergence process? Well, one way to do that is to really focus in on these knowledge gaps. And uh, if you're able to develop trade-off or limit curves or knowledge curves, um, <clears throat> you can close those gaps by really understanding those trade-offs. So that's, that can help, help you decide what alternatives to eliminate or um, where to focus your design efforts. If you're using discrete sets, like in the parallel convergence, um, you'll want to try to aggressively eliminate alternatives. So rather than trying to uh, pick a winner, essentially you just look for the weakest link and that way you can eliminate it. And you don't need to run everything through the same test. Look for that Achilles heel and try to be creative in how you can um, get the information you need in order to make a decision at that level. Don't, you don't always need the most uh, the highest fidelity model. Sometimes uh, a lower fidelity model that you can generate quickly will generate enough information for you to, to decide whether to keep it in the set or not. If you want to gradually narrow those, doesn't mean you have to go slowly, but you'll want to give enough time for other people to react to your set and also to make sure that you've got a known feasible because if, you've, if you have narrowed your set to the point where you're not sure that you have a known feasible, then you've probably uh, narrowed too quickly. So again, uh, what you can use for the convergence process is design reviews. And uh, you don't need to converge every subsystem at the same rate, but it will allow you through these design reviews to determine, you know, do we have knowledge gaps open? What knowledge gaps do we have? What's a quick way for us to uh, eliminate that knowledge gap, put together an action plan, and hopefully you'll have a cadence of these design reviews. So the next week or the, in two weeks, whatever the time frame is, you come back with whatever information you have, you can make an assessment uh, and go that way. And only add granularity as it makes sense. Try to avoid going to detailed design too quickly because if you end up going to detailed design, detailed analysis too early and redoing it, then again, you're caught yourself in a, in a loop back. If you can make your progress visible, that's really, really helpful. So one of the things that you're doing uh, as, you're, as you're evaluating the alternatives in your set is try to make sure that you have compatibility. So try to ensure that compatibility before you worry about getting the design too terribly complete. Uh, because if you spend a lot of time uh, detailing out a design only to find out later that it doesn't is not compatible with someone else, you're going to get yourself into another loopback and again you're producing a lot of waste uh, there. So really focus in on compatibility um, in those er earlier phases and use that as part of your elimination process so that when you get down to deciding you're going to do detailed design and move towards release, uh, you have a much higher degree of confidence that that alternative is going to work for you. Once you've narrowed, uh, you know, you want to do everything you can uh, to stay within the set. So make sure that you do your homework to ensure good decisions through cross-functional design reviews, uh, comparison against design standards, and doing double check. And also uh, try not to specify more than you need to to avoid over-constraining your design space. 
Here's a quick thought problem as we uh, wind down here. Let's suppose that you have five subsystems in your next product and each subsystem team is pursuing an innovative design with an 80% probability of success. What is your chances of, new product, of the whole product uh, being a success? Well, if you run the probabilities, you know that it'd be 0.8 to the 5. In other words, you've got a 33% chance of success. And that's not very good, is it? So let's switch this around a little bit. Let's say that we pursue a backup alternative along with the innovative one. And we set a cutoff date that says, you know, if the innovative idea hasn't panned out by such and such a date, we revert to the, to the backup idea. What is your probability of success then? Well, uh, it jumps up, right? Because now since you can always revert back to the, uh, to the reserve idea, the backup idea, now you have a 100% chance of product success. And at the same time, odds are good that you'll end up with four of those five innovations. So this idea of this gradual narrowing and keeping a backup uh, solution can be really, really powerful in your development processes. Okay, so, so far uh, today we've talked about three principles of set-based innovation. The first one is really understanding uh, the trade-off space and uh, how the design parameters affect your functional performance and do that in, the, in terms of trade-off or knowledge curves. Um, the second idea is this idea of parallel convergence where rather than trying to pick a winner and uh, iterating our way to, uh, to a good solution, we look at sets of ideas and we um, eliminate the weak alternatives and the ones that are incompatible with other subsystems so that we can converge on a solution that works uh, for all. And finally, we want to make sure that before we're committed to an idea that we've actually established feasibility both in terms of uh, functional feasibility but also manufacturability and uh, compatibility with other subsystems. If you apply these set-based principles, you'll be able to move the learning uh, earlier in the design cycle where it's relatively inexpensive for you to learn and uh, therefore you can decrease the cost and increase the productivity of your development teams. And also you can change the knowledge growth curve because you're generating much more no knowledge early in the project rather than later in the project. And if you uh, are forward thinking, you can actually couch that knowledge in such a way that you can reuse it on future projects. Well, that's all we have uh, time for today. I hope this uh, webinar was informative and helpful to you. If you would like to share your stories of set-based uh, principles and applying them in your company, I would love to hear about them. So there's my email address. And if, any of you, if you have any questions, I would be happy to take those uh, by email as well. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Jacqueline uh, to conclude our webinar. All right. Well, thank you, Darwin, for facilitating our session today. Um, before I close, I just wanted to go over a couple things. The first one is that his uh, presentation is available as a handout. If you look on the right side of your screen, there should be a handouts tab that you can click on to download that so you can view it. Um, another thing I wanted to let you all know about is we are launching a new Lightwise webinar series for 2016, and we want you to be the first to know about what's coming. So if you visit www.lightwise.me and submit your name, you can find out what's going on there. So to wrap things up for today, I want to remind you that this webinar is being recorded. So look for an email following our time together for a link to the recording. And feel free to share this throughout your organization. So again, thank you, Derwood, and thanks to each of you for participating in today's session. Goodbye. <laughs>